if you'd stayed doing what you were doing, where do you think you would be now? Burnt out, hating my job, hating the fitness industry. On this week's episode of the podcast is Jake Wilkins from The Game Changer Training. I'm a personal trainer by heart. I don't know anything about numbers and spreadsheets. PTs that think they don't want to sell. Guess what, buddy? That's what you have to do anyway. That's what you've been doing. Understanding as a business person that you need to invest to make more money. And I had that mindset of not doing that. The core of us, like we have, it's, it's nutrition, it's training, it's community, and it's the pillar of, of the game change is the community. So protecting that at all costs is really, really important. His honest feedback to me was like, you're running a shit CrossFit model. And that really was like a kick in the nutsack for me. I was like, wow. Let's jump into the episode. This episode is sponsored by Harbiz, the all-in-one management platform for fitness professionals. Are you a studio or boutique fitness owner looking to optimize your customer experience or a fitness professional ready to scale up their business? With powerful features like client management, scheduling, billing, and programming, Harbiz empowers fitness professionals to grow their businesses and increase their client base. Each professional receives a customized introduction to integrate seamlessly into the platform, ensuring they deliver the best possible experience to their clients through the client app. And if that's not enough, Harbiz offers a free trial to see if they're going to be the perfect fit for your business. Ready to scale up? Learn more at Harbiz or click the link in the show notes. Jake, welcome to the Fitness Marketing Agency podcast. Let's go way back. How did you get into the industry? First of all, thanks for having me, Ben. Um, so this for me started about 14 years ago. Um, I was 18 when I first qualified. Um, football was supposed to be my main job like most of us we come from sort of like athletic backgrounds and if we're honest we fail and fall into fitness and that's if i'm honest what happened um didn't want to stay in the uk because my friends were still playing didn't want to stay in spain because my friends are still playing so i just went on google and searched for fitness jobs abroad um and up to a cruise ship opportunity and jumped on a cruise ship and that's where i started my my fitness journey began on a cruise ship going through <laughs> the caribbean on the west coast and east coast of uh, america so you were born in spain Born in Spain, yeah. Born and in Spain. Cruise ship company was in America? Yeah, American company, yep. And how long were you on the cruise ship for? A total of two years, just under two years. And then you decided to jump ship? Literally, yeah. Just had enough of um, being away and, again, sort of didn't know what I was wanted to do or where this was going to go. And um, you know, America, they speak our language, but it's, it's you get homesick. Like, it's a different, different world, different culture. What was your next step in the fitness industry? Yeah, so I came back after a long two-year contract. I was quite tired. Went back to Spain where my family was just to have some downtime and decided I wanted another contract to where to go next. And then an opportunity came up um, to get involved with a fitness retreat um, in Spain where we just would hire out like a villa for a week, fly clients over. They'd stay in the sun, train, learn about nutrition, do a bit of yoga, some workshops, that kind of stuff. And that just sort of manifested into this business that grew quite quickly. If I'm honest, too quickly, we didn't understand how to run a business and think about taxes and saving money and managing books and managing anything. We was, we was doing everything, the cooking, the cleaning, the airport pickups, everything. Um, and if I'm honest, it, it sort of went belly under because it just got too big for us. Um, that then folded. How did you market that? Facebook. Back in the day when, you know, Facebook, there wasn't an Instagram then, I don't think. Yeah, there literally wasn't Instagram. It was just Facebook, just I think you just boost ads. I can't even really remember or post in the local groups, that kind of stuff. And people would fly over from UK. Yeah, really popular. That at the time they sort of like popping up, so we got in at the right time. They'd fly over for the week. Um, like I said, stay in a beautiful villa, train, get you know, sort of holistically get what they need out of it, and then fly back. And word of mouth was sort of like helped, and yeah, that was that. I think everyone listening or watching this uh, has been on that journey where they start a business. It, uh, it goes wrong or like it grows too quickly and like they, they understand that they need to get skilled up mm. more in, in the areas of business, uh, which you've gone on to do. Um, what did you do once that business like stopped? Yep. So when that stopped, um, just a job popped up on LinkedIn to go back to America, just to PT like a private family in, in, in Miami and South Beach, which was a cool, cool sort of um, opportunity. I, to be honest, when it first came up, I thought it was fake. I thought this English family looking for a British PT. I thought I'll go see what happens. Worst case, I'll have a holiday and I come back. I landed in the airport and there was a chap there with my name with a, with a plaque and got picked up and taken to this family. Stayed out there, PT in for a little bit, which you're not really supposed to do because you're supposed to have the, the right visa. I luckily had like a Siemens visa, so I didn't really get many problems. Um, and then 
yeah, if I'm really honest with that, like you used to have to fly in and out of you know, where we was in Miami. You'd jump on a on a ship you'd, or a boat. You'd go over to the Bahamas, get your passport stamped and come back in again. Um, and then when that happened too many times, the sort of border security looked at it and was like, you shouldn't be here. How have you been advertising? Pulled up my ads on, Cra- on Craigslist and Facebook and was like, you need a flight home, <laughs> home buddy. You banned from America? Or? No, 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 <laughs> no, no. But yeah. they gave me a slap on the wrist and... Um, Told me to go down the right avenues, but that was yeah. So did you build up a really like wealthy clientele? Yeah, so it just started with one family. They just would give us a good wage, uh, gave us a car, gave us somewhere to live, and then just obviously the expat community there. You sort of branched out, and they just sort of built and built and built. That again was like a year, which was again was great because you're living in the sun, you know, living the dream if you want to call it in in America, which was great. But again, second time there, homesick, didn't quite know where I was going to be or what I wanted to do or where I was going to go, and came back and. Yeah, started again, again. And back into PT? Back into PT. So I came back to Spain where my family was from. Uh, at the time, I was living in Spain, in Marbella, but commuting and working in Gibraltar every single day. So just did that drive like most expats do over there. Um, met my current partner there. Everything was fine again, just doing the standards, earning your stripes through the PT world, getting to the 40, 50 hour weeks of constantly hitting burnout. And again, not knowing what's next, what's going to be around the corner because you don't look that far enough ahead in when you're a PT, I think. Um, and then she sort of had enough and wanted to come back to the UK. I saw it as another challenge and moved back f- six years ago. So you're doing a lot of one-on-one PT? One-on-one the whole time, all, yeah. All hours? All hours, the 6 a.m. to the 7, 8 p.m. Just, as you know, just doing what you can to get as much cash as in as you can. And roughly what were you charging? Back then, I think I was £40 an hour. Gibraltar's quite a good affluent place. Um, it was all cash, which is, again, great. Like out there, you have the expat community, that are the, all the head offices for the banks and the gambling companies are out there. So you're busy all day long from the first thing in the morning all the way through lunch. You, literally every PT in the gym was busy all hours a day. So it was great, good way to learn, you know, get, get, sort of get your medals and learn your stripes. Um, yeah, and, and that was that. But something inside of you was wanting more? I didn't know who I really wanted to be or wh- I was always thinking, what's next? What's next? But I didn't, I didn't really have that purpose. And I think I was missing that purpose for a long time. Because uh, do I, Did I want to be a 40, 50-year-old PT? Definitely not. But what is next for the, for the PT? And now I have my own facility. It's not for everybody. Maybe online coaching is for some. Maybe st- staying and being a PT is for others. Maybe it's going into education. But... For me, not having that purpose was quite a big thing because I just didn't know where where I was going to be in my life. What year did you move to UK? F- uh, six. My son's five, so it was six years ago. So what was that from here? Six years ago. And let's talk about the transition from uh, moving back to the UK, obviously no clients, um, mm-hmm. building up a client base again, and then going into the facility. Yeah, so... If I'm honest, that was the hardest out of everything I've done. You'd think it'd be the easiest because this is England. This is essentially where I'm from. It should be home. But I came from Gibraltar where there's only two gyms, three gyms. There's probably about 15 PTs in the whole of the place. And then I came straight into a pure gym, this huge pure gym, 20 PTs, people charging £15 an hour for coaching all the way up to £50. No reputation, no notoriety. No one knew my name. There was absolutely nothing. I remember the first week I went to a boot fair and bought a bloody push bike. I had a push bike and a pay as you go phone and would cycle 5 a.m. to a pure gym to do my shift to go and clean treadmills, which again was a reality shock being told, here's a bucket, go and clean all those treadmills. I'm like, hang on, buddy, I've been doing this for 10 years. Like, I shouldn't be cleaning treadmills. But it again, that gave me that hunger, like, I need to get out of this position quickly. So that soon got me going back to the drawing board like I used to get clients like we all did, talking to people, planting those seed over weeks because I thought if I'm not getting clients today, I'm getting the bike home or the bus home. So it was a quick rocket up the arse to make sure that I was actually being hot on my feet and getting that client base back up quickly. So it was the hardest transition out of all of the places I've been. And for the PTs listening to this, what were your like what were your tips to go get clients? Was it literally just strike up a conversation? Or? Yeah, so I look at it, I like to think of it and whenever I speak to any PTs, it's like, planting a seed like you're growing a plant everyone wants a rose bush at the end but you've got to put the seed in the water first seed in the, you know, in the soil and then sort of gently water it so i would i would sort of scour the floor and be like right this person's in every day at the same time 
their workout is awful. They don't know what they're doing, need some help. But I don't want to suffocate them because when you you know what it's like when you're training and you see a PT approach and you're thinking, don't talk to me, don't talk. You see it when you go into a, a car showroom. When you walk through John Lewis and you look at an aftershave, you think, don't talk to me, just leave me alone. So I didn't want to be like that. So for me, it would be, I'd go and clean the, the kit next to me. Like, and at first we'd be like, hi, how are you? Or I wouldn't even say, how are you? Just be a direct, hey, how you doing? Morning, leave them to it. The next day, Hey, how you doing? And then I'd progress the conversations to just know their name. Then I'd ask them, what are you training? And then it'd be like a gradual daily, weekly build up to be like, oh, let me show you something. So it was planting that seed and very slowly watering it to manifest into them feeling comfortable enough for me to go, let me just show you something over here. Then it would be, do you want a free session or do you want to, I can give you 15 minutes of my time. And then that's how I'd build them up to eventually be like, you know, this guy knows what he's talking about. And then that's how I do a strike on my cord. So that still works. <laughs> like there's, that's the still old school way that you I should I think there's a couple of takeaways there. Rather than going from like zero to 100 with someone and then them being like, okay, this is too much. Mm. Like taking those baby steps. But it's the same now as a gym owner with your marketing, like planting those seeds yeah. and understanding that they won't harvest straight away and you have 100%. to be, have to be uh, patient. So you built up the client base in Pure Gym. Mm-hmm. And then what's the transition from there to opening your first facility so from the pure gym the next jump was to a fitness first gym which was literally around the corner um i just popped my head in to see the gym and then the next minute the manager had me sat down with a contract in my hands and i was what's going on um managed to move my clients over to there um and inside fitness first most fitness first obviously most of us who have been in them they have like a little concession inside a little coffee shop or little shops inside and the goal was i wanted to get my hands on this little coffee shop or my partner did anyway um but we didn't sort of know how to do this. I was building up my client base in there. Um, I didn't, with obviously your self-employed PT, you pay your own taxes, you do your own stuff, but I didn't quite enjoy the management breathing down your neck. Where's your uniform? Where's your name badge? And it's like, I'm not employed by you. I'm here to service my clients and your clients and do what I need to do. And I just got sick of the cons, you know, how quickly the staff turnover is in, in the commercial world. and. I just wasn't enjoying my time there at all. I had a client who had um, an old barn conversion and she offered it to me. And again, that was a bit of like a scary jump. Do I want to leave the comfort of that commercial gym where you've constantly got a pool of clients that you can go and approach if you want to? Um, and it was just, just took the jump to go into this old cattle shed that it was. It was like an old chicken shed, basically. I had like a thousand pound credit card from Aqua. I think that's all I could get my hands on. Bought my first squat rack and a few other bits of kit from Facebook and that's how it started. I remember that first week was, it was like terrifying. You know, in between your clients, you'd sit there in this quiet gym thinking I'm used to bodies being around me. And that was the first jump and that's where the game changer originally started from. But I didn't know where it was going to go or what I wanted it to look like yet. And then that's how it sort of slowly developed over time. What switched in your mindset? Um, belief in myself, I think for sure, like often most of us, we're constantly climbing forwards. And this goes for clients as well. They do the same. There's, they don't ever stop to look back how far they've come. And it was realizing you were constantly climbing the mountain. It's time to just look back over your shoulder and be like, well, I've been doing this a long time. I can do this. Back myself. I believe in myself. I put myself in these situations in the past where I don't know anyone. I'm in a different country and just backing and believing that I can do this. And yes, I think that was the biggest thing for me, just that self-belief. If you'd stayed doing what you were doing, where do you think you would be now? Burnt out, hating my job, hating the fitness industry. And I think that's what it got to. Um, because for me, the transition from being a PT into a, a, a gym owner, a facility owner was, I was just constantly getting burnt out, which is natural. We're doing 40, 50 hour weeks. You're not prioritizing yourself, your sleep, your food, your own happiness, your social life, which all of us, every single person who owns a gym has done that. And it was the first time I actually met Ollie March on. It was my 30th birthday, went away to a lovely sort of manor house in, in, in Harpenden with my, with my partner. Um, we sat in a spa at lunchtime and she said, we've got a session at March on in half an hour. You need to get your gym kit on. And I was like, we've got a glass of champagne in my hand. I'm all right, thank you. Anyway, got dragged to March on, got my ass kicked by Charlie. I think he did the session at the time. Um, and then that's when I had the pro proper first chat with Ollie and I was explaining my situation. I've got a baby on the way. I'm a PT. I don't know what's next. I'm burnt out. I've got this little place. And he helped me from the very beginning draw out, well, this is how you do small group PT. And he helped me and sat down and just sort of wrote out the whole the blueprint of, of the business for me. 
How did you feel walking away from that session and speaking to Ollie? Oh, like like the door, the, like the wall had been removed because I was, felt like the ceiling was here and then I didn't know what was next. So Ollie literally just lifted the ceiling and was like, there's a whole world, like you're, you're, an, you're a baby, like you're an amateur in what you're doing. Like there's, there's so much more you could be doing to give you back the freedom to be a dad, for your own training, for you to fall in love with the fitness industry again. You don't have to be doing this. So for me, it was that clarity of there's more than just being that 50 hour PT. So a good birthday present. Oh, huge, huge. Got my ass kicked, finger throw up in the bathroom and uh, yeah, <laughs> come over life lesson from Ollie. So what were then, oh, let's go back to that, that meeting actually. So what was the business plan? It was small group PT, but it, the biggest question there was how am I gonna transition with the clients that I have from that into the small group PT um, model. And roughly how many clients did you have at that point? So at that time I'd got my, when I left Fitness First, I was that PT who had 30, 40 clients and some of them are doing once a week, some of them are three times a week. We all know clients that come once a week aren't going to get the results that they need. So when I took the jump straight away, I thought I need to charge more money. I just want to keep the clients that I enjoy training. So I put them in buckets, good clients, bad clients, shit clients, sent an email out to the good ones and said, these are the days I'm going to be working. These are my times. These are, this is my price. First come, first serve. All my favorite people came forwards train two, three times a week. So everything was fine. But then again, when I was going to suddenly go from that to, hey, you're going to be sharing a session now with six other people. That was the hardest thing. So did you get some pushback? Yeah. Uh, do you know what? More so, the people that can afford to train three times a week, they think that they need personal training. And we all know that, again, not everyone needs personal training. You get more done, you get better results when you're in a group. It's more fun than talking about what you did on the weekend and how your dog is and where you're going on holiday next. You don't want to just be that paid help who's just there to train them three times a week. Because again, that PT 10, five years ago or to the, the richer community is, it's a status thing. So I had a bit of a pushback from them, but the other guys are saying, listen, it's going to cost you half the price and you're going to be able to come twice as much, you just have to share me in your session, that's all. So there was a little bit of a pushback. Um, and it, when I just first started just advertising that or promoting that, it was just purely just on the local Facebook groups. And again, there was next to nothing coming in, but it was about just slowly building that transition into that model. What would you say to the PT who's in that position that you just explained right now, trading time for money, stuck, hit that ceiling financially, exhausted, why should they consider switching to semi-private? Um, first of all, I don't think they should necessarily, everyone should. First of all, you need to ask yourself, do you want to be a gym owner? I got into this to help people because I loved coaching, but I spend most of my time now sat at a laptop. I'm not a techie person at all. I still enjoy the training, the communication, the community aspects of the gym. So you need to understand that when you come into this and owning a business, your role and your identity is going to change. So do you want to be a business owner who has to deal with the boring stuff, the numbers, the spreadsheets? Do you want to do that? Because that's what you're going to have to do. Or do you just want to carry on and charge more and bring your client base down? And are you are you happy with that? Do you want to go online? But also have you earned the right to go online yet? Because that's the other thing. Online is so easily accessible these days because you see these Instagram stories of guys in Dubai and Ferraris and Lambos and G-Wagons earning X amount a month and it seems easy. But if you've never trained a client and don't understand how to coach a person, you're not going to get very far very quickly. So I think you have to ask yourself, do you, it's not for everyone. Do you, is this what you want to honestly do? What's the driving factor behind your decision to do it? Freedom. For me, it was 100% freedom. I'd at that time, it was like 10 years in, 50 hour weeks, burn out, no social life. My name's Jake. My friends call me Jake the Flake because I'm the guy that doesn't show up to birthdays, doesn't show up to events. I had, the, it was just work all the time. But because I love it, doesn't feel like work. But people tire of that. Relationships, family, like my family in Spain would barely go and see them because I'm working all the time. So for me, having a child when my firstborn was, was on his way, that was the driving force to create something more than me. That's why I didn't call it Jake's Gym. I wanted to create a brand that it was just something that people could get behind and I didn't have to be the face of it because I didn't want it to be about me. I wanted it to be about this thing that I've created over my years of experience, taking all the best bits of what I've learned from strength and conditioning, from CrossFit, from everything that I've tried in the past, packaging it into what I believe is 
the true methodology of what everybody needs, regardless of your 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 age, your ability, or what your goals are. Um, but that was, I guess, my driving force was I wanted that freedom. I wanted to be able to be a dad. I wanted to be able to just actually, enjoy, what, what's it for otherwise? There's a lot of people watching this who don't really understand what semi-private coaching is. So what is the what is it? What's the product? How long is the session? Uh, what are the components? What are the exercises? Mm -hmm. Neither did I. At first, neither did I. When I look back to when I look back at mine and I look at the old videos, I'd have a, I'd have a leg press, I'd have some battle ropes, I'd have six bits of kit. There's six fires to put out, or eight bits. Of kit. That's the circuit. Circuit training is not small group PT. Personal training is if I was personal training you, I'm it's that, but it's just in a group, giving you what you need, what she needs, what he needs, and what he needs is taking that personal training product, but being skilled enough to be able to deliver that to everybody else. So is each client got an individual program or is it one set program for the six? Yeah, so, no, so it's a one set program. So I do the programming. My background's S and C, so I, I program in 90 day blocks. So we have like a, we have that that we, we go over every single month, it changes and we have a testing phase at the end because that's my background is data driven. We want to see where the progress is. Um, we create the program, but it might, for example, just say squat and it's up to the coach to decide. We've got a 77 year old in our gym. We've got a 19 year old. We've got PTs that come and, and pay to be members. So it's about the coach delivering what that person needs in front of them. So everyone is individualized, but it's not right. You're going to do a lap pull down while you're doing a hack squat. That's not what it is. How long are your sessions? Uh, 50 minutes, five zero. And when you were PTing, was it 60? I was that PT that ran over all the time <laughs> at 60 minutes and I hate it now if I go into a gym and you can always tell when the PTs at the end of their session because they go over and do some useless ab exercise. You think you're just trying to burn your last 10 minutes where for me, I always wanted to make sure my clients had their money's worth. So I was always that guy who would run over. I'm professional. It's not okay. I'd run over by five minutes to make sure that they feel they've had the best. But then obviously that feeds into the next person. So it's just that constant. But yeah, that, that was one of my downfalls. So with the sessions changing out to 50 minutes, like why, why did you do it? What are the benefits yeah, that, of that? Yeah, that's a great question. Because the reason I want to go deeper on this question is still a lot of group training facilities are still doing hour on the hour, every hour. Um, so it'd be good to get your insight into why you've capped it to 50 minutes. Okay, so we used to be an hour. And if I'm honest, I'd like to be an hour because it gives you that buffer to be able to cool them down properly, to be able to have conversations. You're not rushing, looking at the clock. But for us, we hit a bottleneck and for our clientele, we're really busy in the mornings and we're really busy in the evenings and we don't have much daytime traffic. Um, and it got to the point where the bottleneck was getting so big, I needed to do something. So we originally tried 45 minute sessions to try and squeeze in a, a, an earlier session. And we went from, instead of starting at six o'clock, we started at quarter to six and just tried to squeeze a 45 minute session. Did it for a month, didn't work. It felt too rushed. It was, the quality diminished. So then we decided, Let's push back by another 15 minutes. Let's start at 5.30. Well, first of all, we're the only people in Milton Keynes that start at 5.30. No one else opens as soon as we do. And that is one of our busiest sessions because people want to get in, get out, get back to their kids that are still asleep or get on a train and go to London and work. So we've targeted an area that's not being fulfilled. You still have that today? We, we still have that today. Like today. That's quite rare. I don't hear of many gyms. Oh, it's uh, horrible. In, in the UK, in the US, that they open at 4 and 5. But UK market, Irish market... Mm. Yeah, I don't hear of that. So I also think it, you might say this as well, being a father, but on the weekends when I train, I get up before everyone else is awake because I don't want to piss off the, my missus and, and be selfish and train because she's got the kids. I want to get my work done, get it in, get it out and get home on time. And I arrive with a coffee in hand to keep everyone happy. So there's a market for, there is a market for it. If you open your gym at five, people will still come. Pure gym's 24 seven. Anyone, go to the challenge yourself one day, go to the gym at 4 a.m., maybe not 4, 4.30. You'll see people who know what they're doing, they're training, because they really prioritize their training, they really care about it, Does it, you'll make time for it. So 5.30 is half an hour difference. Obviously, the coaches aren't going to be best happy because they have to get up a little bit earlier, but there's a market for it. But on the flip side, I would like to go back to an hour, but I don't think it's wise because that 5.30 session is crucial. is crucial. People want to get it done and, and we I, can we can make it work. I guess it gives you time to decompress that the too. gym, like sort the gym out, next yeah. lot come in, the car park. I don't know what your car parking is like, yeah. but a lot of gyms, right, it's quite tight. So 
the one group goes, it gives 10 minutes for the next group to come. Yeah, so because we have three coaches on the session, it's it's literally like we have a military position. It's, it runs smooth where the first class is fine. And then obviously as one class is leaving, the next one's arriving. So one coach will stretch off the next class whilst the other coach is getting the next class ready. And then the other coach is the person who's setting everything up. So making sure that the dumbbells are gone away, the plates are gone away, the racks are ready. So we're just working as a team perfectly in sync to make sure that everything is running it is hard to stay on time but again it's as a coach you need to have an eye on the clock at all times you need to be aware of your of your surroundings but that hour would give you a buffer would it give you better more time to have greater conversations yeah would it would it help you to you know um, to create better better relationships with people yeah i would like to go back to that hour but that 5 30 is, is really important in our gym let's go back we'll, we'll come back to the product and the service in a second but i want to go back and fully understand met ollie he laid out the business plan and then what did you do to go from that client's barn which i guess you were paying rent in yep. to where you are now yeah so that was just before covid so we was probably had the barn for like a year before covid the last six months i was trying to um trying to tone down the one-to-one -one and increase the P, the small groups at the time I would only do small group on a on a when a Monday Wednesday and a Friday showed Ollie my homework this is what I'm doing he looked at it and was like that's that's not small group PT mate you need to give people flexibility and frequency first of all you need to open on a Saturday first and second of all you need to open you need to be have sessions five six days a week and this will be way more times you're limiting people so it's pointless so again went away wrote it all out again and then I think there was a point. I think it was just two, three months before COVID hit. I sort of revamped the gym, painted it all, got some new kit in, got rid of everything, started again in this small little space. It's probably no bigger than the studio. Um, and completely had, it was Monday to Saturday, small group PT, got rid of the one-to-one, sent out that same email. Sorry, guys, this is the new model. If you're in, you're in. If you're out, you're out. Really sorry. Um, and then it was sort of just gradually growing nicely. I was finding my feet, again, just learning the ropes of how how, how it works. Um, no staff. No staff, just me. Wasn't even check-ins in those days. Just treat, there's a small, I had like 12, 15 people. Um, and then COVID hit. And there's like, right, okay, what's next? Obviously, I didn't have a commercial property, so I couldn't get any government grants. My client was like, we can still, you know, come and train your barn, which is no good when people can't leave their house. So I literally gave all my kit to my clients, kettlebells, dumbbells, go home. We'll do it from Zoom like most people did. And just try to, it was damage limitation, try and keep hold of what I could for, throughout throughout that weird, strange period. Simultaneously, my other half, we'd had that coffee shop in fitness that first that I spoke about. Oh, she took that over? She took that okay. over. It first started off as a meal prep company. So I, at the time I was training a lot of boxers and they had to cut weight and they had to make sure their food was on point and I had a, a couple of rugby players as well. So they used to say to me, can you just do my food? And I'm, I said, I'm not gonna do your food, I train you, that's enough. But at the time she used to work in a marketing company and when she got pregnant, she told her boss, um, she got fired, went to tribunal, actually lost if you can believe it. Um, and it was distraught, didn't know what to do, but she had been studying a nutritional sort of degree in the background because she wanted to get into food. And I said, listen, I've got this pool of clients that will literally bite your hand off for it for tomorrow. And then she started up this meal prep company. And that's where the cafe, which is today, originated from. Because it just simultaneously worked hand in hand. So she then went on to take on the coffee shop. Um, and then fast forward into lockdown, obviously it's a concession. So you can't get into fitness fair. She just couldn't look for it through the window, through lockdown. We couldn't do anything about it. So we decided to go and um, buy like an old box trailer, turned that into like a coffee van. And she went from healthy meals into like brownies and cakes and that kind of stuff and we would just park up our little trailer on like on our local estate we'd have queues up the road nothing else was open. nothing else open and people want to support a local business but there was we had no way of putting a nappies on on our kids backs and earning food we didn't we weren't signed off from like most people were from their businesses and getting paid i wasn't getting any, any government help because my unit was owned by my my landlord who was just essentially an old client so there was literally no money coming in and we couldn't get anything so we had to just go and make something work so it was keeping the clients i had on zoom get, getting that coffee trader up and running keeping the brand alive and sort of i guess that almost um that then manifested into her when eventually lockdown did finish and i need to i've decided i need to get out of my barn because it's too small i need something bigger um 
we found these units that would house the gym and then we'd found a unit right next door that would house her small coffee shop. And then that's how, how it all started after, after lockdown. So you guys truly had your backs against the wall. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you had to hustle hard. Yeah. So you came across this unit, uh, same landlord or, or separate? Yeah, uh, com so completely different, like just like everyone else now, like a, an estate agent, a commercial estate agent. These are business rates. What's the business rate? <laughs> these, all these things I'd never heard about. I was just so excited just to get my hands on something. I didn't barely read the contracts. Yep, I was signing it. I didn't know what a good price was, a bad price was. Now I do. But we were just excited with a vision and an idea and a plan. And we just needed somewhere to go in. And this was at the back end. So when Boris was letting everything open up again, I think it was the May the 12th all the gyms opened and I still didn't have the keys to my place. So I was like, I need to get in here quickly. So when we eventually got the keys, um, it took me two weeks to just completely smash it out myself, converted it all into the first iteration of the gym. And then the builder's hat would come on and I'd go next door and try and get her coffee shop up and running. But that's that's how this all started. Jake, we'll flash up some footage of your gym so people can visually see it. But can you just talk us through um, as I walk through the front door? Yep. So you walk through our front door and that's into our, we've got like a, our first little main room that used to actually be the original coffee shop before it moved into the next door unit. Um, and that's where we've like our rugs sort of live, our lockers, fridges, that kind of stuff. And then you go into the main room, which is like a, it's like a funny shape. It's like a, a hexagon, if you wish. Um, and that's where the main sort of gym takes place, where the small group PT offering is. How big a square foot is it? 1,007. Not usable because it's not a rectangle. Like I said, it, it was a shop floor. So we've all, we've essentially put a, um, a circle into a square and then just try to do the best we can with what we've got. So if you're listening to this, just make sure you watch it so you can visually just see what we've uh, splashed up on the video of this podcast. So your partner signed a lease on the coffee shop. You signed a lease on a unit for a gym. Yeah. Uh, it's a coincidence that they're side by side. Yeah. Uh, the baby's born at this point. So my son, my son was three and I had my daughter who was just born during lockdown. So we've got video footage of you know, my missus holding the baby with a paintbrush. Like that's just how we've always done it. True entrepreneurial story. Just, just, just get it done. Uh, a lot of people would have uh, retreated backwards, mm. uh, faced the adversity that you, you were facing. What persevered you to keep going? Didn't know anything else. Didn't have a choice. That's all I knew. There wasn't. The, like Tony Robbins says, like burn the boats, and I truly live by that. There's there's only one direction. I didn't know anything. Where was what was I going to do? My before this it was football. That's long. That boat's long sailed. So it was do it, and there's no choice. We had to go and make the coffee trader work to to earn money. We had to go and get the gym to earn money. So there wasn't any retreat. It was let's just do what we can, what we've got, and just instead of looking backwards, just look forwards because this hopefully will end, and there's going to be another side to it. And I think that period the bad died and the ones that are good and the ones that have a good product are the ones that went on and thrived and I feel like the fitness industry boomed since then because we lost that connection we lost that community we lost we lost what what it is and that's just brought everything back together and I feel like the fitness industry just shot forward after lockdown so you got permission to open up from the government you did so what are you charging back then for semi-private so my semi-private then was we used to do our 30 day trial, which was like 99 pounds. And I think my membership was like 119. And you could come like six days a week unlimited. Again, young pup didn't know what I was doing. And how, how did you market it? Um, Facebook posts, uh, little boost, little 10 pounds boost to try to <laughs> get some more likes. And I'd sit there, it was almost like build it and they'll come, which we know doesn't work. There wasn't, to be honest, there wasn't any marketing strategy. I built it. Where is everyone? And the sales process? The sales process then was to get everyone, anyone who did inquire, just come in and try a session, come in and try a session, and then hopefully for the back of that, they would, they would, they'd want to sign up, which was 50-50 because once they realise what the price isn't, what a pure gym is, they're out of there. Even though they see the value, they might have done had a great session, you get people that understand that they want to invest into their fitness and you get people that just still want to hang around in pure gym for £12. So come in for one taster session? Yeah, but it's pretty hard uh, for a business owner to e explain the whole value oh, in that one hour. Impossible, because you're trying to coach the rest of the paid clients. You might have two or three people on free trial. Mm. Um, so it's fair to say that that model doesn't work. One hundred percent. So I've been in that unit for three years. That first year, when we had a rent-free period as well, it was like three months. Not most people would capitalize on that. I had no idea what I was doing. So the first year was almost wasted. Built this thing, didn't really know where it was going. All alone still. 
And the true growth happened in the last two years. We've joined you. I put my foot down more on the accelerator with Gym Owners Network and working with Jens and Ollie. And really, I use this expression a lot, but turn, try to turn professional in it. It's not amateur anymore. I've, I completely see the mistakes that I made. There, was no, there wasn't running a business. I was just being a coach and have my doors open for anyone to come in. You've been very open and honest, and this will massively help a lot of people in the industry. Can you just list out like more of the mistakes that you made when you opened the doors? Yep. So the first one was just me. There wasn't really a plan. So it was being on my own and not hiring any staff, um, having no plan. So again, I was stuck in that mindset of a PT. And we spoke about this off camera. The PT mindset is you think in weeks you do, or the, the next month because you want your client to renew and buy another pack of 10. Okay. Where when you have a facility or a business, you have to start then looking at quarters and years and one year, two year, three year, five year, 10 year, you have to have a plan. I had no plan. It was literally doors open, come and have a good time. That was it. There was no plan. Gym's open a year. Uh, how many clients are you roughly at at this point? I think it was like 20, 25. All semi-private though. All semi-private. Um, you touched base with Ollie again? Um, I touched base with Jen. So Jen's is co-owner of Gym Owners Network. PFCA so obviously their job or what they're trying to do is elevate the the industry because as we know that the the bar is quite low for entry for personal trainers and that's what I love about them the most is they're trying to upskill everyone so we can all do a better job so I looked at who is doing the best in our industry well everyone knows March on everyone knows Ollie they're the flagship essentially so it was looking at looking at him and saying well he's doing a great job how that's what I want essentially so I bumped into Jens at PerformX he was like, hey, bro, how are you doing? You can hear yourself as African accent. Um, asked me where I was at, told him where I was at. And again, he's like, you need some help. Let's go. And it was just a matter of me again, because my, I guess my out, my income wasn't very high at that time. Like we had like three, five grand on diet debits, which is like nothing. But at the time, I thought that was great. Um, and again, it was him lifting that limiting belief and going like, there's another ceiling. Like this could be like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 grand a, a month. And I, for me, that was just unfathomable or just to understand it. So it was touching base of him, explaining where I was at and for him to be like, again, you're at like the infancy of your journey. We've got this huge road. Like, do you want to, do you want some help doing it? So what precisely did he help with? Um, product. So again, looking at the product, what are you doing? Is it small group PT? Um, what's the serv What's the delivery looking like? Um, what are your numbers? So they're like heavily, Gens is very heavily about tracking data so you can understand patterns and you can see where you need to place more effort on and your, or your energies, what's working, what's not working. Are you getting leads organically? Are they coming paid? Are your coaches dropping the ball with their cohorts? And it was about, again, I, I didn't have a spreadsheet in that first year. I didn't. I might have made something on on on, on Excel where I just had the list of my members and how much they're they paying so I could just see how much was coming in. And that was the extent of a spreadsheet for me. I'm a personal trainer by heart. I don't know anything about numbers and spreadsheets. So it was, again, being educated on this is how you become a business owner. I just want to touch upon that first thing that you said that they helped with was the product. So you're already an experienced PT and a ton of people that listen or watch this are in the same position. And uh, sometimes in the industry, we feel that I'm a really good PT, like my product's fine. It doesn't need improving. So from your standpoint, what did they help improve and how did that show up in the business? Yeah. So first of all, I feel like if you think like that, you are a little bit arrogant because I could think like that. I've been doing this for 14 years, but the people that feel that they've completed it, they completed the game, they're the ones that you've just got to the end of where you're going. Like you're not going to unlock any more levels. That's the reason why believing investing into mentorship and working with you guys, because this is a, this is a game that you can, you just got to keep playing it. And it's a game that's never going to end. So thinking that, you know, you're the best person is, or you, you can't learn any more is, is, it's not going to get you fine. It's, it's really arrogant of you. How did Jens help you deliver semi-private mm -hmm. better? Yeah. So um, Jens, he popped down to my gym and just helped me re restructure the layout because the layout was wrong for the product. Um, and again, like he's always looking like, show me your programming. He's obviously looking on Instagram, what we're doing all the time. And his honest feedback to me was like, you're running a shit CrossFit model. And that really was like a kick in the nutsack for me. I was like, wow. 
But again, that's my ego because we've got to have that white belt mentality. And it was about listening to people that know more than you who've done this and work with better gyms than you and taking that feedback on board. So it was about me stepping back and zooming out because it was all about me. I was doing all the training. Of course, it's the best. That was my mindset. But it was about stepping out and going, actually, what could we be doing better? Where are the holes in this bucket? So when you're in it all the time, it's really hard to see, but you need other people to dissect your homework and tell you where you could be doing better. That's exactly what he did on, on the product front. Yeah. And then they obviously helped install further systems. Yeah. Um, you came on board with FMA and we turned on the lead flow. Yep. Uh, and what happened from there? Yeah, so that again was down to Jens. He drew me out the triangle. This is your product. This is your marketing. This is your sales. He's like, you've just got one layer of your, your, your pyramid, which is the product. You have no sales. You have no marketing. You need help. You're now in the position where you're earning enough to then go and invest your money into a marketing company. And obviously I'd seen all your ads all over Instagram and had all the colorful letters that turn up and the protein bars and all the cool stuff that you guys do. And I was always, in, again, intrigued about it. And I'd get your emails, but like you'd read the success stories. And I thought, no way, people can't be making that much money from a campaign. That's crazy, that'd be life-changing, that'd be insane. I, I didn't believe it. Um, and again, when I was at that point, in my first year there wasn't much money coming in so it was quite a big investment but again it was about understanding as a business person that you need to invest to make more money and I had that mindset of not doing that like just keep the money in where it's like no 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 you need to change this mindset so I just took the jump came to your first mastermind and then again that was like a, a huge unlock I'm in this room full of loads of other gym owners like me more, they might be less experienced in the world as a PT as me, but their gyms are doing way better than the mine are. And again, understanding that just because I've been in the industry longer than them doesn't make me better than them or, or vice versa. So for me, being in that room of like-minded people that I could ask questions to and everyone was just so open and friendly and, and helpful. And the present, the presentations, the keynote speakers, everything was, again, it was just like that, that self-belief, like there's more to this game. And then since we fixed that side of the triangle where we had a marketing strategy and I can have a button that I turn on and off and then I have a sales process. Again, I didn't know anything about sales, didn't think I knew anything about sales, but then going all the way back to the cruise ship days, on that ship we used to have to sell. And I was like, well, what do you think you do as a PT on the gym floor? Well, you sell, you're going and you're, you're creating conversations with people. So the people with PTs that think they don't want to sell, guess what, buddy? That's what you have to do anyway. That's what you've been doing, but you just need to do it in a different way. So. For me, and it was one of the, one of the your last talks on at the end of the 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 the, um, the end of the mastermind. It was there's so many people out there that need help, and that for me was like a huge switch because I didn't want to feel like that sleazy sales guy that's calling you to sell you something. But when I when that switch flicks, like I'm not calling you to be sleazy and sell to you. I'm calling you because I generally have a solution to your problem. And I have that mindset every single time I get on the phone. I'm like, you've hit my advert. You've clicked my button because you're sat there unhappy or you're sat there in pain. You've clicked my advert. I haven't come and knocked on your door trying to sell you window cleaning. You've hit my button. You've put your name forwards. I can help literally change your life. All of the gyms that are in this country, we have the ability to change life. So having that mindset switch for me was huge in terms of confidence as well. I remember my first ever sales call, I mean, I told Luke, I remember putting on like a Wolf of Wall Street clip of him like thumping his chest and I was walking around the gym like catching my breath like, I'm going to call this person. I remember I was terrified. But once you get through your first 10 bad ones and 20 bad ones and 50 bad ones, you know, and that mindset f switch flicks and you're not, you know, you're not stuttering, you're not mumbling your words because you have to in that mindset of, I generally have a solution to your problem if you want it. And for me, it was that huge unlock. So for me, coming here was building the two sides of the, the pyramid that I needed, the sales flow, the, so this, the sales process and the marketing flow. Fast forward to now, um, just give us an overview of what's going on in the gym, number of clients, uh, price point, team, and uh, everything like that. Yep, so still a small group PT model, real P real small group PT model. Um, we're a team of four, including me. Um, we have two entry points. So we have a 30-day trial, which we've always done. And then we also have a six-week um, foundation program, summer challenge, whatever you guys are suggesting. So, so just to interrupt, is a 30-day trial on the website? That's on the website, yeah. but we use that as... If we have any friction on the phone with somebody where the six weeks obviously is a larger sum, 
we can sort of back sell them into, well, we have got this other option. On our website, it's this price. We have this 30 day trial. It's, it's, it's 189. So we, we sell our 30 day trial for 189 and then we sell our six week for 247. And then obviously when something is priced higher and our monthly membership is 189, it's just an easier sell to transition into at the very end. So someone finishes 30 days with you or they finish six weeks with you and then they're pushed into 189? Yep, 189. And what do they receive for that? So at the moment, this is where we need to get better at. So we're in the process of trying to find a new unit. And then when we move into this new unit, the pricing structure obviously change. We need to be a lot stricter on how we use our credit systems because it's in the past it's been free for all. You pay your month, you pay your month for membership, you can come to whatever you want. Now, we know that clients aren't getting the most out of it because they're potentially overtraining because they can come six days. They think that they, they get, that, but in the end, they're just sort of hindering their results. Um, but for what we currently sell, it should be two PT sessions a week. So we have two offerings on the gym floor. We have small group PT sessions and then we have like a larger class offering, which is more conditioning based. Um, so our small group PT will be one to six. So we generally have three coaches on the floor for that one. So you get your two PT sessions a week and then you can come to however many of the other sort of condition sessions where it's one to 18. Do you sell a standalone membership for conditioning or not? No. So you, the one membership gets you access to two yeah. options. So the, the messaging that we give people is we want you to come to strength training sessions because that's where the gold lies. That's where your results are going to be. And if you can, and if you want to sort of buff up your week, you can book into those other sessions to work on your fitness. Those sessions are a lot more low skilled. You can't kill yourself on an assault bike. You might feel like you're going to die, but you can't kill yourself on an assault bike or doing a bodyweight workout where the PT sessions is where you're on the barbells, you're squatting, you're deadlifting. That's where you're actually feeling like you're in a PT session. Rather than just beasting someone in a cardio session, which yeah. we still see that this day and age mm. where people are just selling oh. like a beasting. I, I, I hate, and I generally mean this, I hate circuit training. It's just a means to just, in the nicest way, fuck people up. It's just, you, you're just killing people. Any idiot can kill someone on, on the gym floor for even half an hour. But it takes a real professional with, with a good brain to understand how to program to be able to yield results and we do that on our PT sessions but we also do that with our condition sessions so we know that Hyrox is popular we know that Affex is popular turf games are popular so we don't want to take away from our main PT sessions where we're focused on strength training but in those conditioning sessions that's where you're going to find your Hyrox simulations your your Affex simulations and again as popular as they are and as great as they are for people to get into I, there is a part of me that dislikes high rocks because people think they need to train high rocks to get better at high rocks. It's like, no, you need to make sure that you're prioritizing your standard movements. You need to be able to squat, deadlift, bench press. You need to have those foundations in and then that's just skill development, practicing the sled, getting good on your feet or running. So it's trying to find that blend to keep people happy with what they think they want, but at the same time, we know what they need. So we're trying to just find that, that middle balance in the new facility where it'd be larger and we'd hopefully have two gym floors, we'd have the two offerings running side by side, which would give us an opportunity to then sell a, a, a more sort of cheaper membership to come into those classes. But then part of me thinks like I don't want to do that because that's taken away from we're a small group PT gym and that's who I want to be. I don't want to be a class gym. So it's about finding that middle ground about keeping them happy, but giving them what they need at the same time. That famous saying, sell them what they want, give them what they need. <laughs> yeah. Can you just go into, uh, from your experience, um, you said you hate circuit training and I see it as well. And this is why the, the job that the guys are doing, uh, Jens and Ollie and PFCA, elevating the fitness industry is crucial. Like if, what is wrong with that? Get, you know, surely they're just burning some calories. Mm. They're getting their heart rate up. Yeah. You know, what what is what would you say to the PT, the gym owner that is offering that right now? Well, first of all, we've all done that. I've done that. You've done that. Everyone who's a PT, we've done that. And then the more skin we get in the game, we realise how shit that is. And it is just giving someone a sweaty workout. Now, it's a good place for someone to start. Like you could walk into any commercial gym and you'll see someone, the, the, general, the general sort of transition for someone into gym we all know they go straight to the treadmills and they stand at the back because it's in the dark and they can they can hide back there and see what's going on. Then they see a bunch of people coming out of a spin class all happy and high-fiving. Oh, that looks a bit of... I could maybe do that. It's dark in there. Then they might venture into there. Then they might do that for six months, a year, and then they complete that and it's like, oh, what's next? And then they might sort of venture onto the gym floor because they've got a bit more confidence. They've lost a little bit of weight. And then they practice, have a little go on the machines, I don't know what they're doing. And then they might go on to ask a PT for help. Um, 
But what the circuit training is doing is not a lot. It's again, how can you keep an eye on someone's form? How can you make sure there's good movement quality? You can't. You can't. If you've got a circuit going on of twenty stations, that's twenty fires to put out. Twenty people running around like headless chickens. It's, there's no purpose behind it. So, if someone listening to this comes into your gym, everyone's going through a squat pattern of some sort. Mm-hmm. Let's say that's the compound lift or movement of the day. Is that right? One hundred percent. So we get everyone in for a one-to-one assessment first. Doesn't matter if you're a personal trainer joining my gym. Doesn't matter if you're Rosie, who's 77. Rosie, by the way, she's badass who turns up in lifters and can squat more than most people. But we need to know who you are, what you can do and where you've been, regardless of who you are, what your ego is and who you think you are. We need to understand what your movement quality is like, what your fitness levels are like. Then us coaches will get together and I will do the one-to-ones and then present them to my coaches. This is who we've got. This is Ben. He's got some ankle problems. He's he's ran a he did a high rocks last year and he's damaged his his shit. He's got like <laughs> his, his knees are gone now. Shock. Um, so we need to make sure we're being careful. Blah, blah blah. So we'll have that assessment first. And the point of that one to one is we can then try and get them up to scratch and build a better idea of what they're where they're at and what they need. So that when it comes into the sessions, we can really individualize depending on who's in front of us. So in the mornings before the session starts, we'll have a little team huddle. We'll have a little look at the booking system. Ben's coming in. Remember, he's still struggling with that injury. So let's make sure we're doing X, Y, and Z. So everyone is briefed on it to make sure that it's quality of movement all the time. Um, on that note, what booking system are you using? So we use Kooks. And those team meetings are happening in the morning for the morning sessions and then again in the evening? So we, we have a, a team huddle every morning. So the, the idea is like come in early, have a cup of coffee, just sit there for a minute and just have a minute and just look through the booking system. So we're not going to be surprised that someone turns up and because again it's about being organized so it feels professional and looks professional we want people to rem- to know that we remember what is wrong with you or remember what you need because that goes a long way with them um so we have a little team meeting in the morning little just a little huddle and then me and the senior coach will have a meeting on monday which is strictly about members we're not allowed to talk about anything else other than members problems amber members people that could be coming could be going injuries check-ins that kind of stuff and then on friday we have the main team meeting where everyone's welcome that might be a brunch in the cafe next door and then that will be everything so we'll just catch up how's the week been how's the program been any changes what do we think of this or it's raining tomorrow so we can't we can't go on a little shuttle run it's just a, an idea, a way for us to get together and just again just decompress from the week and then plan so what should we do better next week well i thought that we could potentially throw this accessory in instead of that good idea let's do that and then we're trying again because time's quite short it'd be great to finish that with like a little team training just to keep the huddle going well we've seen and heard horror stories of like the the programming for the day is just whatsapped 10 minutes before oh, the session no. there's there's no booking system or there is a booking system but you don't know who's turning up you don't know the information about these injuries haven't been passed to the, the coach that's taking that session and then gyms wonder why their retention rates are, are poor so let's just switch to to that what what roughly are you sitting at retention rate um, so our retention touchwood is is really good. So our attrition the past quarter were like three percent. Like I think from the beginning of the year we've lost like ten members in six months, which is it's a, when when they did leave they were left in the same month. So I thought it was catastrophic, and I thought the world was ending. But again, I have a little chat with Jens, and he's like, just zoom out, look at it over six months. You've lost ten people in six months. That's crazy. Well done. Expect to lose five a month. And when I get that feedback, I'm like, okay, because I wouldn't know that otherwise. So that's it's that important. I feed back to my coaches and I'm their mentor, but I need someone to go to as well at the same time and ask for help and who's going to put me on the straight and narrow. And I guess those 10 that left, two, three or four of them because pregnant moved out the area. like It, it could be... Uh, some It was out of your control, right? Some, some of it is, but then sometimes you do need to um, have a reality check and be like, it's an opportunity to step in and be like, right, let's zoom all the way out. Are we doing the best job? Is the product actually as good as we think it is? So again, it's, you have to constantly be looking at that all the time. That's the point of the meetings. And it's the point of every month, zoom out, why is someone left? Okay, well, they want to go and practice high rock somewhere. Well, do we have the, the the kit for it? Can we bring it into ours? So again, the high rocks to me is very similar to circuit training, but I've gone against my will and I've bought bloody wall balls and I've bought like a tank sled so we can simulate these things to try to, again, plug that hole. But again, it's about zooming out, like, are they getting enough check-ins? Are they getting enough accountability? Are, is the processes and the systems there? Are we? Are the touch points happening or are, are they not? Who needs to be held accountable for this person leaving? And then you obviously getting feedback from Jens as well, which has been crucial. Yeah. Um, what's your trial to member rate? 
Um, quite high. So at the moment, again, we're like, when I looked, looked at our quarterly review, we were like, 87 percent so it was pr pretty damn good 80 percent but again w with our with our our joiners and our lead flow we some campaigns obviously we have like 150 leads come in but i am quite strict on the quality of them so i'm honest if i have a conversation with someone who's like really awkward and they want to join anyway but i'm like this person sounds like a dickhead i'm like you're not going to fit my culture of my gym and i've done it a few times like i've had like a guy on the phone who's like and i'm like Listen, man, I'm like, are you okay? You're like, your day are right today. I don't know what, what's happening. They because they're like someone. rude or just they're like... rude. They're what? They're short. You know, you, you can tell like this pattern. I'll ask, are you okay? Are you having a bad? Do you want to pick this phone call up tomorrow? Like, are you alright? Because you don't know what they're going through. But uh, if this person doesn't fit our community, then I'm not. I don't want to damage our community because for the sake of two hundred quid. What's the point? Because it's gonna it's gonna upset it. Like the core of us like we have it's, it's nutrition it's training but it's community and it's the pillar of, of the game change is the community so protecting that at all costs is really really important so I could just get anyone joining yep join 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 and I'd probably grow faster and I'd probably get to the new facility faster but I care more about the quality of the people coming in because the better quality they are well they're going to stick around for much longer our retention rate is high our attrition is brilliant our longevity of member is great like our members don't leave i mean obviously it's going to happen touch wood but people do come to the end of the line but i feel i feel like it is you have to vet your leads better so you're the gatekeeper mm. what are you doing to vet those leads is it, is it literally the the first 10 seconds conversation having you think okay this person's not for us or? we get i mean it's about asking the right questions so it goes down to being a PT, consultation is crucial for anything. Ask the right questions, get the right answers, and you can build the program what they need. It's the same on the phone. It's about asking the right questions. And again, you don't know how bad that person's day is going at that time, but you can get a general idea for people. And I do, but I say to them, do you want to have a call back tomorrow because you sound like you're a bit distracted? And I might call them back tomorrow and then they're way better. But again, it's about asking those questions. So it's going to be hard. Our training is hard. Like It's hard getting up and coming to our 5.30 session. Are you that kind of person for us how do you take this how do you take that? again it's about constantly asking to, to figure I like out it they from are. a psychology standpoint because mm. you're, you're sw switching it because most gyms will just accept anyone yeah. and the consumer knows that but then suddenly you're making it a little bit harder for them to come into this exclusive community club and I guess people want it more yeah well I want it to be inclusive for everybody but at the same time I want everyone in my gym to get along and I, and I want everyone to enjoy their time there. There's a lot, enough stress in their life outside the gym. So when, when, when they come, it's to be their place to de-stress, decompress and enjoy training with their friends. I want them to come not necessarily for our coaches, but because they get to train with their buddies at the same time. But again, it's about just making sure it's not like, you know, this is a club, you can't come in, but about making sure you're getting the right people through the door. Uh, how many members are you sitting at at the moment? Um, just toppled over 100, like 107 from yesterday. How much secondary spend is going into your partner's business, the the, the coffee shop? So next they're year? completely separate entities, completely separate. But do you see people go there afterwards? Oh, or? sorry, yeah. Um, so that's one. Se of sorry, secondary spend into her pocket. Okay, yeah. So that that is great for us. So like on a Saturday yeah. where we have our Saturday sessions, no one's in a rush. Everyone sounds up a bit more happy, a bit more chilled. Um, and obviously this coffee shop next door is ideal. They hate it because they get a mass rush of 20 clients with 20 tickets and 20 coffees or protein shakes that they get ordered. But it helps. And it also helps feedback into me. There's often, we'd have done a game day and they were like, we have a live DJ on game day. The doors are all open. There's people coming in out. It just sounds like controlled chaos. But people will walk past and poke their head and be like, what is going on in there? And they can see that there's people who look like them they're just normal people in our gym. So it does help pull in from there. And at the same time, I purposely program on a Saturday, we just do like a little shuttle run outside the gym. So the members, the, the coffee shop people that sat outside having a coffee, they're just sitting there on a dog walk. They can see, there's so many people have said to me, I joined because I saw so-and-so from your gym running past all the time. And it, they looked like they're having fun, they're laughing. Or these people that are a little bit larger and they look like me. I didn't think it was just all for fit people. Because again, it's hard, like when you what you put on Instagram and social media to make sure that you're you're trying to capture everyone, but it, it definitely helps having the two units side by side. Talk me through what you're doing currently for your organic marketing. Yep. So Instagram is the best and the main thing for us. So when you when I zoom out and I look at Instagram and I look at the people that I'm following, why am I following this person? What am I getting out of them? We don't want to be that page that are just showing you how to do a deadlift because I, I personally don't see any value in that. 
but it's people watch Instagram like a documentary because they're bored at work or they're on the way home or, or they're sat on the sofa at night flicking through. So for me, it's about constantly telling that story of what our day looks like, what a day in our life the coach looks like, what our members look like. So we, we have this, I'm always trying to say a minimum five stories a day, make sure we post on the grid. So we have like a structure of our Instagram, there's, there's guidelines to follow. But that for us has been huge because we anyone that follows or anyone that interacts, we live in the DMs in terms of it's that outreach, that's that opportunity to be to plant that seed. We're not selling to you and jumping down your throat like we spoke about in the PT gym. It's about hey, thanks for the follow. Um, are you here just to consume the content, or or like can can we help you? Do you know what I mean? And some people ghost you. So every person that every, follows your page, every person you're reaching out. Thank you for the follow. Can Hope we help you? Can we help you? And we might not, we might not get anything back, but at the same time, we get, we get 50, 50. Some people go, yep, just wondered about the price. And then again, it's like, I don't want to give you the price <laughs> in the Instagram inbox. I'm trying to get you on the phone. And then that's when I step in or the sales guy step in and try to get them on the telephone. But for me, you can't just ignore people on Instagram. They're reach, they're too scared to to reach out to you sometimes. How often are you posting on the grid? So on the grid with three times a day, uh, three times a week. I believe that it should be every single day. But again, it's about making sure that we're, um, we're creating enough ideas and, and we need to be a bit more structured and systemized with that. So we need to be playing in the head a little bit more. So again, I think adding more people to our team so we can sort of take away jobs from other people and create that, that role would be great. But we have that structure of five to 10 stories a day, five minimum, post as many as you want, but three times a week on the grid. And the coaches are in charge of that as well? One coach and myself. What's the Insta handle for the business and for you personally? Yep, so the business is at the Game Changer Training and then I'm at Jake Wilkins. Let's switch to sales. So you've come from a uh, background of selling PT like your whole career. So what are you doing differently now versus what you used to do back then? Um, so it's a, it's a different life for, from from obviously what, we used to, what I used to do. You'd walk the floor as a PT. We don't have the opportunity to walk the floor anymore. So it's about think about thinking outside the box. What are these consumers doing? Well, they're sat on their phones because they're bored of their life or they're bored of work or whatever they're doing. So it's trying to put as many fishing rods out in the water as we possibly can. So we still do the old school leaflet drops now and again because I still think there's... They do work. They do work. They do work. I'm the kind of person who just has a little flip, like flick and chuck them in the bin where my other half, she's like goes through every single leaflet. So... Her, her background's marketing, so she's very much like, you need to still do leaflets. You're getting a company to do this for you? The coach yeah. is hitting the, fl- no, the roads? So we, we used to have a company, uh, quite, quite well, if you actually look into it, it's quite well, easily priced. It's, it's not expensive to do. We pay just a little bit more, so you don't just get a handful of leaflets of the local pizza and kebab guy. I want just mine coming through the door, and I'll pay for like a, a thicker, nicer leaflet. And I learned that from you guys. You, you guys send out really nice stuff, which makes you stop and read it, and it makes you actually want to keep hold of it. So I think that's really important. Um, but yeah, we, we pay a company. You could use your coaches, but we, we I'd, I'm in that mindset of pay a professional and get it done properly. And you're distributing these leaflets like every quarter or every other month? Yes, yeah, so we do it like it quarterly. And from that, you, you can get track on our ROI. You know that people coming in, holding the leaflet, they're well, talking about. Yeah, so yeah. I'll use like a tagline. So like make sure you quote the word X. Um, and the company that we use, they have like, they'll give us like a status to say that it's been delivered in these postcodes mm-hmm. and we can pinpoint which postcodes we want to deliver to as well. I, I really like that. I did that back in the day for, for my business. And so many people are just so reliant on meta ads and they don't look at other, mm. you know, there's so many people just not on meta. So how do you reach them? Yeah. Well, something through the door. Yeah. yeah, and there's still there's still so many more avenues. Like, yes, there's paid, which is important. You need to have that switch on all the time. The standards, old school, of walking the, sh- the high street and, and creating those conversations. Like, we have the coffee shop next door. My other half has a deli as well around the corner. So we've got those two bases, but we could still, there's still things we're not doing. We could still go and attack our high street. We still want to be the name that people think about. If you've got a wedding coming up, if you've got a high rocks coming up, if you've got an injury... I want to be the name that anyone that, that comes to people's mind. So there's still boxes we've not ticked off yet. Like the other day, there was like a local fair, and they have like a you know like a fun fair comes around and there's loads of stalls. And two days before, I'm like, oh, we should be down there with a tent and take the take the bloody tank sled down there. And we could do a challenge and we could give away thing and we could have our DJ there and we could have the coffee van there. So we could. There's so much more that everyone can be doing. Like there's there's, there's so many more avenues. You're, no no one is doing everything. And that's how you get that brand exposure, mm. like the lead gen coming in. Uh, on the sales front, though, um, you're now doing calls, right? And selling over the phone. Yeah. Um, so previously you used to do old consultation or free trial. So what difference has that made? 
waste of time for most of the time that they ever don't show up or that's the other thing I used to do I'd, I'd speak to them on the phone like yeah come down for your for your consultation and up with the aim to charge them after and then the other just wouldn't show up so there's a lot of no shows just a waste of time I probably did that for like a good year and even when I first started with you guys I was too scared to do the one the one call close I was like who's gonna who's gonna pay that kind of money over the phone like I, I wouldn't no chance but and I was too scared to do it but now that's the only way we do it and I think you can only do that once you've had so many no shows. You're like, I'm not wasting my time anymore. My time is worth money. My coach's time is worth money. It's like anywhere. If you go and get your teeth done, get your hair done, like anywhere, like you don't, you have to pay. You don't just book an appointment no. and not show up, which is so common. Yeah. It's such, so frustrating. Um, so just remind everyone, how much are you charging for that trial and roughly how long are those phone calls taking? So it's one eight nine. Or for 30 days, or we have our 247 for six weeks. The majority of people do take the six weeks. Um, and I think that most people go, well, I'm just going to do the six weeks and go, go go off on my own. But I'm like, well, it gives us more time with you to make you fall in love with us. And we have a great conversion rate from both, probably more so from the six weeks because they've had longer. Because obviously four weeks, 30 days isn't that much time. They might so miss one, two sessions. You dip. Uh, you, you fuck up and you dip. Yeah. But six weeks, you can dip and come back again and you can still build that routine. And how long is it taking you to close those deals on the phone? It used to take, I used to be on the phone for like 45 minutes, like an hour and, you know, waffle on. And then... It wasn't until like, again, just learning from you guys and l spending more time learning about sales and conversations. And again, going back to like, this isn't sales shake, this is consultation, just like you just do with a client, you're just asking the right questions. So now I can be done in like 15 minutes. So you, you can bang out more if you need to. So 15 minutes, 200 pound uh, plus brand new yeah. client. What tips would you give to someone listening to this who's struggling with sales? So you gotta get on the phone quick. That's my other mistake at first is I'd, I'd wait week, 10 days so longer. When, when the inquiry would come in. Boom. You need to get that phone up because they're in the buyer's mindset. So already they're 50% in. So they've clicked the link. And if you're calling them, I can't get to people that quick, but we try to go like in a day at least, in that same day, minimum 24 hours because they're ready to buy us. They're warmer. So you've got to get on that phone quickly. And then again, just not thinking. You, like you, you, have a, you have the solution to people's problems. And that for me is the biggest thing. To switching the switching mindset, mindset that you can transform that person's yeah. uh, life like i have what you need like you've you've come to me i've got it you want it i've got it this of course it's going to cost you money you're gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna literally transform your life your family's life your relationship with your husband probably your relationship with your people at work like you're gonna become a better person what is next because you've touched up about um the unit space uh, off camera and you mentioned it uh, on the podcast just now so what is next so next um we need to be moving somewhere ASAP I've been looking for a year and most people who, who will listen to this who've got units or multiple units you know how hard it is to, to for it to happen and, and it takes quite a long time so it's about finding the right space I could jump into a space quite quickly but it has to be the right space for signing a long lease I've got, I've got a long lease at the moment but if you're signing a long lease it needs to be the right place so the future the next six months has to be we have to find the new location we have to move why when we well we'll be able to have more clients per hour because at the moment we're just limited to 15 people per hour we have waiting lists on those sessions which is not okay um i need an office like i work from coffee shops <laughs> i work in my car I do sales calls on the weekends with my kids in the car and i'm jumping out in some random car park chucking them an ipad and i'm in the rain like that's not okay. I need an office. I need to, again, it's about turning professional. I need an office. We need showers. We need changing rooms. We need two gym floors. I need a, a place that I can have. This is the main offering, which is small group PT. And then we have the large group. We've learned a lot. And from the coffee shop, like I feel like it's super important to have that third space. That's why first base is called first base because it's important to have that little space where a community can come. You can come and work from, like Jerome next door has done a great job of his. Like it's just that centralized hub these kind of gyms are all about community and if you don't have a space for the community to build then you, you're sort of losing that so you're looking for a specific space rather than rushing into a massive industrial unit or whatever it may yeah. be you're looking for a unique spot has to uh, be for you to expand um service more people and, and, and continue to grow the business we will definitely do part two when that happens and it will happen um you know based on everything you've said and how you've overcome adversity and you know continue to push through um you know you know, given what you've you face in your, your time in the industry um what would you say to a rookie gym owner who is either aspirations to start a gym or they've just opened up their gym uh, give them um some some top tips um you can't do it on your own <laughs> you cannot do it on your own 
um, I would definitely say you need a mentor. You need someone who's been there before you to show you how to get there a little bit quicker. And obviously they've made all the mistakes so they can warn you about the mistakes. Otherwise you're going to be like me and it's going to take you longer to get there because you fumbled your way around and sort of trialed and errored, which is fine. But it's important that I feel like you need marketing, for example, I look at you guys like you're just a virtual member of staff that is in, is important, it's in, imperative to what we do. You're always going to be there because you, you're you the professionals at that. So I'll let you do what you do. So I feel like you have to have that marketing process. And if you don't know how to do it yourself, get someone to do it for you. You have to have someone that you can go to with questions, whether it's a someone else who's been in the industry who, you, who you're quite friendly with that you can turn to. I still do it. There's loads of gym owners with you guys, with Jim Rose Network, like I turn to and we'll have good conversations and ask them things as well as Jens and Ollie. So I feel like you have to invest into your business. You can't just keep everything you're earning. You have to reinvest that, not just into equipment, but more so into people that are going to help fast track you there quicker. So get mentorship, get guidance, which yeah. you did with Jim Rose Network, and then reinvest in the business to take the business up to the, Constantly. To the next level. Constantly. Jake, thank you for coming down to the podcast and telling your story. Definitely, as I said, I want you back for part two when uh, you move into that facility and you, you expand. Um, so I appreciate everything that you've said and thank you. Mate, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to the Fitness Marks and Agency podcast. If you enjoyed it, make sure to subscribe so you can catch future episodes.